we want to mess with you guys. I don't know. You guys have already figured it out. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to acknowledge, of course, we're on the traditional territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And today we're here to announce uh, uh, the beginning of our uh, opening up of elective surgeries, the, the phase two of the BC Restart Plan. COVID-19 has changed so much of what we do and how we interact with each other. We've worked hard together to flatten the curve and we've made great progress. Dr. Henry and Minister Dix have been advising us on that on a regular basis, but we can't lose sight of the importance of ensuring that if we're sick, we stay home. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the, the compromises that we've made to our interactions with other people are not lost. Those huge sacrifices, of course, have included, as of uh, May 18th, 30,000 elective surgeries that have been canceled. That's 30,000 people who have been having to endure pain and other suffering as we've worked together to address COVID-19. But because of those sacrifices, we've been able to move forward. Yesterday's plan was a slow and safe restart, and it will include guidance from Dr. Henry and other public health officials as we bring in the important changes to how the province will operate within the economy and within our healthcare system. So as we resume elective surgeries, we're going to have to ensure that we have safety protocols in place for patients, safety protocols in place for surgical teams. And of course, as we start to discuss how we will bring these elective surgeries back online, it is an option for patients to wait until they're more comfortable to enter the healthcare system. But every precaution that can be taken has been taken. Right from the beginning of this pandemic, we've been focusing on ensuring that the public interest is front of, cent front of mind and that the health of British Columbians is our preoccupation. As we enter this new normal, we're going to continue to be washing our hands, keeping a safe distance, and of course, staying at home if we're sick. Now is not the time to let down our guard. Now is not the time to forget the sacrifices that people have made. And instead, we should remind ourselves that 30,000 British Columbians have been suffering not just by not seeing their friends, not just by not uh, going out to uh, enjoy uh, the splendor of British Columbia, but they've been living in pain. Today, we'll start the process of relieving that pain for people who have been suffering because of the, uh, the lack of elective surgeries. I'll turn the, the microphone now over to Minister Dix and he'll lay out how the plan will unfold from this point forward. Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and uh, Dr. Henry and I will take you through the presentation. Uh, it's a shorter presentation than that we provide in the technical briefing, but all those presentations, including our surgical plan, will be available online. I'd also uh, like to thank uh, Michael Marchbank, uh, who, uh, who authored this plan along with many other people in the healthcare system. Uh, Mr. Man Marchbank is the former president of the Fraser Health Authority from 2014 through 2018 as an outstanding uh, healthcare leader in our province, and we're very appreciative of the role that he played. On March 16, uh, 2020, we took the very difficult decision to postpone non-urgent scheduled surgeries. And you see this, uh, and you see the effect of it. The Premier just spoke of the effect of this. And our commitment to you is this. There has been an enormous commitment by healthcare workers, by the healthcare system, by the Premier, by the government to address the healthcare effects of COVID-19. Dr. Henry showed this in the presentation on Monday about the relative success we've had, especially compared to other people in dealing with people who had need, required the care of critical care and had COVID-19. It has been an extraordinary effort. It has been a 100% effort. And our commitment to you is that we're going to see the same kind of effort from the healthcare system, 100%, to address the backlog in surgeries caused by COVID-19 in the coming months and years. Um, all patients uh, needing surgery are at the center of the surgical renewal. We will do this in the safest way possible for patients and providers. We'll be 100% all in in this every effort. And everyone involved in the healthcare system is committed to this, this idea. The next slide talks a little bit about the pandemic effect, impact on surgery, about the numbers. Our estimated number of lost cases, you'll see on the slide, is 30,000. 
14,000 of those had their surgeries postponed because we scheduled them in three-week increments, 16,000 who had been normally scheduled in this period on the wait list. So that number, as you can see on the right here, is 30,298. We've also seen and are seeing productivity de decreases because of the measures that Dr. Henry will be speaking of in a moment, the measures we've taken to ensure surgeries are safe. I would note that approximately uh, 17,300 surgeries that are urgent have been conducted in this time. We've continued to provide urgent and emergent surgery or emergency surgery, but nonetheless, um, and so the healthcare system has been busy, nonetheless, the impact on uh, patients has been considerable. I also would note that 24,000 people in our estimate have not had referrals for surgery, have not been added to surgery lists, and that is an, another significant thing we have to deal with. That COVID-19, as I said, wiped out many of the gains we had made in recent years in increasing the number of surgeries significantly as occurred uh, in the 2018, 29 year, 8, 19 year, for example. And it's impossible for us to catch up without significant program changes and increased capacity. This is what we have to do for one another. And I want to turn it over now for the next number of slides to Dr. Henry to talk about some of the clinical protocols that are required. Thank you. As this um, pandemic uh, reached us in British Columbia, we recognized that we needed to take uh, extraordinary measures to ensure that we could provide safe care, um, both for people who had COVID-19 in our healthcare system, but also for those who needed healthcare in other sectors. And part of that was the actions that we needed to take to ensure that our surgical teams and people who needed surgery during this unusual time uh, were, were cared for as well. So there were new clinical protocols that were developed to manage patients during surgery. Part of those were making sure that uh, people didn't have any symptoms, that they hadn't been in contact. But we also recognized that when we had COVID-19 circulating in our community, there would, people that, would be people that may be carrying it. So we needed to treat every surgical patient as if they might have COVID-19. And that led to protections such as decreasing the number of people in a room when we're doing procedures like intubation, putting the, the, the breathing tube down into someone's throat, because we know those are situations that increase the risk of a transfer of the virus. These protocols were needed when we were having our increase in community spread here in BC, and they were based on evidence and discussed with um, the clinical expert reference group that we put together here in the province. They were informed by public health and by um, the epidemiology of what we were seeing in our community. Now that we have flattened our curve here in BC, we need to, to take a different approach to this. So we know and we are working very hard in public health to identify every single person who has COVID-19 in our province and that helps us understand where the transmission is occurring. And that means that we can safely resume surgeries and we no longer have to assume that everybody has this. We can now safely assume that most patients do not have COVID-19. And that allows us to change the protocols and to make them um, no less safe, but certainly a little more streamlined. So to be able to enhance and, and increase our surgeries for those who need it here in BC, we have um, we've now put in place very extensive screening protocols uh, for everybody who comes in for surgery. So when you get your call about uh, your upcoming surgical date, we uh, you need to continue to self-isolate. Make sure you're not putting yourself at risk by being out in the community by um, having contact with people that you have not had contact for in the next little while. It's going to be incredibly important that we all continue to take those measures, but particularly if you have surgery scheduled. And then um, we will be having a, a detailed screening protocol for everybody at that 24 to 72 hours when you get a pre anesthetic consult. Um, there will be a screening protocol to make sure that you have not been in contact with anybody, that you don't have any symptoms, and we have a protocol in place that allows for rapid testing should anybody have symptoms and it be required. And then that process will be repeated um, on your day of surgery so that everybody is confident that we don't have people who are at risk or have risk factors for COVID-19. Obviously, if there's urgent surgery that's needed, those protocols will be sped up and put in place as well. 
So these pr uh, clinical protocols and the infection prevention and control measures are what we need now to make sure that we can ramp up our surgeries and get people in for the, the procedures that they need and keep everybody safe. And it depends, of course, on the work that we continue to do in public health to make sure that we are testing everybody in our community that has symptoms of COVID-19 and that we're rapidly able to do the contact tracing and isolation that's needed um, to prevent outbreaks and more spread in our communities. So the first uh, step of the surgical plan will be to, to uh, establish uh, system readiness, which is the next slide. Uh, patients will be called, um, are being called and will be called over the next uh, 10 days to confirm they are willing and ready for surgery. We know some patients may be concerned with that and we're going to engage with them and their uh, primary care physicians on that question. To protect healthcare workers, of course, as Dr. Henry has talked about, new clinical protocols on managing patients through surgery are being implemented. The needed PPE, supplies, and drugs required for surgeries have been confirmed. This is a key part of our readiness, and I've been reporting regularly, especially on the issue of PPE. The beds required to care for, for surgical patients as well as COVID-19 patients have been confirmed. That's part of the planning, and that screening programs and pre- and post-operative care services are being operationalized. This is very important because in addition to surgeries lost, the fact that we've done considerably less screening, for example, uh, fit tests for colorectal cancer, for example, uh, mammographies and so on, we've done less of those in these times and we're going to have to catch up there as well. And in some cases, we will be discovering things that we would have discovered earlier. Our surgery, uh, our surgery renewal plan uh, beginning this month is going to be a massive renewal. It is a hugely ambitious plan that will keep up with new demands for new surgeries and clear the backlog created by COVID-19 over the next 17 to 24 months. The plan has five key steps, increasing surgeries, increasing essential personnel, focusing on patients, adding more resources, and reporting monthly and in detail on progress. Next slide. The surgeries and essential personnel, we want to speak to that briefly. To increase surgery capacities, we will refine and update processes to minimize the 30% productivity loss I spoke of earlier, extend daily operating hours, including weekends, open new or unused operating rooms in the healthcare system, and contract with private surgical clinics that agree to follow the Canada Health Act. We will train and recruit the healthcare professionals we need to deliver and sustain renewal in the months and years to come. That includes uh, in the area of anesthesia and surgeons in other support staff and nurses. We'll also, and on the next slide, talk about patients, resources and reporting. We'll continue the local collaboration on prioritization of patients. In other words, that requires the clinical advice of, of uh, experts in the system, of doctors in the system in particular. We'll focus on patients who are urgent, had surgeries postponed, or, are waiting for, uh, have, or have been waiting more than twice their clinical benchmarks. We will maximize day surgeries such as cataracts, which are frequently done outside of the hospital. Like many programs and services impacted by COVID-19, the delivery of this plan also requires added financial support. We believe it will be in the order of $250 million in the first year, and we are committing to making uh, the required investment to support renewal. The Health Ministry and Health Authorities are committed to transparently updating British Columbians on the progress of this plan by Health Authority and, and by month with regular reports on strategies as they are being implemented. So we just want to lay out what the targeted timelines are. Uh, May 7th to 15th, contacting all patients who had surgeries postponed. May 18th, starting non-urgent surgeries up again. May 31st, contracting private facilities to work at maximum capacity. In June, training, recruiting and hiring more staff. Uh, June 15th, running all existing operating rooms at full capacity. So that is what we're looking for. A month where we will continue to lose ground but start to do uh, scheduled surgeries and then hoping to get to full capacity by June 15th. And then from June to October, all surgical lo locations begin adding capacity by extending operating hours, adding weekends and adding new operating rooms. As noted and as Dr. Henry has suggested, all of this is dependent 
on, uh, on avoiding resurgence of COVID-19, and our plans include plans to address that should it arise. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite uh, the Premier back to the podium to take questions. Thanks, uh, Adrian. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, and I think, Jen, you're... Yep. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to queue and unmute your phones. You won't be audible till we call your name. Our first question comes from Tanya Fletcher. Hi there. I know in the uh, technical briefing you broke down kind of the, the target goals for nurse recruitment. I'm wondering if you can talk about how many surgeons and anesthesiologists you'll be um, trying to, to track down, what the goal uh, numbers are there, and, and how you and where you find, find, plan to find them. Well, um, uh, the plan with respect to nurse recruitment is approximately 400 nurses. It's our hope to hire all the graduating nurses this year and to significantly increase training so that nurses who are existing in the system can upgrade skills if that's required and also to hire all of the staff required which will include not only nurses and uh, anesthesiologists uh, and increasing our capacity there but as you note, surgeons but also medical office assistants that are required cleaning staff that are required people who are involved in and very importantly in uh, in device reprocessing so it will require a significant investment across the system as we spoke of in the technical briefing that's approximately 400 nurses okay next question our next question comes from Vrishti Basu hi everyone thanks for doing this um, I just want to circle back to uh, patients being called starting today uh, will this call be just to make sure they still want to go forward with the surgeries or uh, are they also going to be rebooked in at a specific date? What can people expect today? Well, the first call is to touch base with them, to, to let them know that we're starting again, to see how they're doing and to engage with them on uh, both their willingness to go forward with surgery. And uh, then as we go forward, we're going to start booking surgeries. But the, uh, we need to talk to the people who have uh, seen their uh, surgeries delayed uh, to begin with, and that's what we're going to start to do today. That's a necessary step in restarting the system. See about their, uh, their, both their willingness to go forward and to talk to them about that. There will be uh, some people who are naturally reluctant. I think uh, you'll know for our daily briefings that we've gone uh, right now, we're at about 4,600 emergency room visits a day from the previous average of about 6,500. So people are reluctant at times to come to hospitals, so we have to, uh, we have to uh, prepare for that and we have to talk to uh, patients about that. Our next question is from Mary Griffin. Oh, hi. Thanks very much. Um, uh, this question came up in the briefing, and I just thought I'd ask again. With with um, so many surgeries on the wait list, what, why um, not go with the 24-hour um, operation of the operating rooms to clear the backlog? And also what also came up is it was um, quoted that it was easy to shut down the elective surgeries, but can you give us a sense of just a, how much of a gargantuan task this is to bring them back up? Well, uh, like everywhere else, I think uh, COVID-19 is affecting hospitals like every workplace in BC, and so we're having to take steps to deal with uh, what we call productivity losses, but the extra time we have to, to take to make sure that staff are safe and to make sure that patients are safe. So uh, it does take uh, extraordinary effort to relaunch the system. The shutting it down meant uh, for those who, who had non, what's called non-urgent schedu scheduled surgeries, which is what we uh, delayed. It was, uh, in some respects, easy to shut that down. It's easy to say no in a system. Much harder to get going again because we have cases continuing into the system. We have to assess patients for the urgency of the surgery. It's an enormous challenge. And because we have people on a wait list already, and this simply adds to that and uh, presents a real challenge for the system. But I think we're up to addressing it. We're going to throw everything we have at this issue because I think the people who have uh, made a real sacrifice in seeing their sh surgeries delayed, uh, those people deserve that. With respect to 24-7, you'll know that in the case of MRIs, for example, we've done that around BC over the last couple of years, moving I think from uh, two machines going 24-7 to, to nine machines going 24-7 to 19 going at least 19-7. Surgeries are a little different. Uh, we need human beings. They need uh, 
they do need to sleep and so what we what we're doing and and to prepare and we do have to staff surgeries in a significant way so what we're doing is extending the plan is to extend the hours every day uh, for surgeries and then to look at weekend surgeries so we can increase our capacity this is how we can increase the number of surgeries we can do reduce the the COVID-19 related increase and then we hope continue on to reduce wait times once we get through this coming 17 to 24 months. Our next question is from Justine Hunter. Hi, thank you. Um, how much of the success of this plan hinges on surgeons and anesthetists and nurses who are willing to expand their hours and give up their summer holidays, work weekends, and, and what's the backup plan if you don't get that buy-in? Uh, on my way to, to uh, the legislature today, where we are now, I uh, ran into a surgeon who was biking and who told me about their commitment to get going, how determined they are. These are their patients. And I think it's, uh, and I, I speak of surgeons, I think of nurses, I think of people who keep operating rooms clean, who perform such an important function. Uh, they profoundly care about the success of the system. They are determined to deal with this backlog. And so I think we're going to have uh, enormous buy-in from everyone in the system. This is what they do. This is their life's work. And this is the biggest challenge in terms of surgery that we've faced uh, in our healthcare system. And uh, so we need to be uh, all in on it. And I know that our staff, who have been extraordinary, and it has been a challenging time, both for the mental health of people in acute care and across the healthcare system of people who have been on the front lines of COVID-19. But I also know uh, their extraordinary motivation. And I think together we can, uh, we can make enormous progress. And uh, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to report, as I say, monthly on how we're doing. Next, we have Vaughn Palmer. Uh, question for the Premier. Um, what, what's been described to us here sounds like a, a major transformation in the healthcare system from operating hours to staffing to training to um, changes for productivity and everything. Uh, there is a funding increase as well. Um, but I guess the question I would have is, can you see that this transformation which is done to clear the backlog could become a permanent thing in the healthcare system in British Columbia? Uh, good question, Vaughn. Uh, we have since 2017 been focusing on trying to increase productivity within the system. Uh, Adrian spoke about diagnostic services that were multiplied uh, in our time leading up to the advent of COVID-19. That was a transformative change in determining how many surgeries were required. We were creating more opportunities for those surgeries. And I remember quite vividly uh, when Dr. Henry and, and Minister Dix and I uh, started talking about the pandemic plan and the consequences to uh, elective surgeries and the impact that would have on individuals. And we resolved then, some months ago, that we needed to have a plan to make sure that we could try and get to the place we'd worked so hard to get to uh, in January, February of 2020. Uh, Adrian just touched upon, uh, Vaughn, the commitment of healthcare practitioners, whether they be care aides, whether they be uh, janitorial staff, whether they be nurses, whether they be uh, admissions clerks. All of the people involved in our healthcare system are committed to the well being of the people that they serve. And, and we're going to be redoubling our efforts. It's very ambitious. And I think that ambitious can be infectious as well in a positive way. When we see success in our personal lives, we try to, to uh, duplicate that day after day. And I think the system will want to do that as well. We're asking a great deal from people, but I believe they're prepared to give it. And, and we will be doing what we can on the resourcing side. Uh, Adrian uh, and uh, Minister, uh, the Minister of Finance are, are in a regular contact about what this will mean uh, over time. Uh, but we're focused right now on getting back to a place where people can have confidence in our health care system, which is uh, in, many, uh, in many ways the envy of the world. Certainly in North America it is, and, and we're proud of that. I'm, I'm fiercely proud of the work that uh, the ministry has done to get us into this place, and I'm absolutely confident that we're going to be successful. Our next question is from Moira Whiten. Hi, Premier. Thank you. Um, my question is a follow-up on, on Vaughn's question. But, you know, would we potentially see a scale down after the pandemic-related backlog is cleared? I know that's a couple of years away. 
but um, earlier in the technical briefing, it was mentioned that this is kind of an expedition of um, a five-year surgery plan that was in the works. So is that five-year, is that a timeline that we would see this sustained, or what is that timeline? Well, uh, as the technical briefing uh, suggested, uh, this is not something that will be resolved over the course of the summer. It will take time, and, and we're committed to it. Uh, we wouldn't have brought it forward if we didn't believe the system was uh, able to handle the, uh, the increases and the diversity of, of solutions. Uh, we are outside the box in many ways. Uh, Provided we're working within the Canada Health Act, we believe uh, that there is capacity. And if we uh, challenge that capacity to expand and we work on increasing the number of graduates we have in uh, healthcare professions, if we increase uh, the resources available, and, and that is our commitment, we'll be able to achieve these goals. Our next question comes from Keith Baldry. Hi, thanks for this. This is um, more about reopening than, than surgeries. Just getting inundated with um, a calls and emails from Albertans wondering in light of the request to stay home and not travel, are, are, are Albertans welcome in British Columbia this summer, Mr. Premier? Well, uh, certainly uh, Albertans are Canadians. Uh, we have mobility rights as Canadians. Uh, these are fundamental principles. Uh, but I, I know from talking to Premier Kenny, I know from talking to other premiers across the country, uh, the objective is the same wherever you may live. If you don't need to travel, you should not. You should stay in your own community. We are just now reopening after uh, what has been a difficult and challenging time for British Columbians. Uh, many people in rural and remote communities are concerned that the, the full effect of COVID-19 has not reached their communities and they're fearful that it may arrive. That's why uh, we worked, uh, Minister Dix and I and others, uh, to put in place a rural, remote and Indigenous community strategy so that we have the capacity to bring people to acute care services should they need them. And so my, my recommendation to Albertans is the same as my recommendation to British Columbians. Stay home, enjoy where you live, do the best you can to, uh, to work together, as we have been doing, to flatten the curve and, and ensure that as the summer progresses, we can have more interaction with our neighbours, whether they be Albertans or, or people from the Maritimes or any other part of Canada. But for now, it would be better if you stayed home. Next, we have Laura Brom. Hi, I was just wondering if, um, so uh, you mentioned that some surgeries will continue um, it, even if the, the patient has COVID-19, but in some cases it would be cancelled. So if it does get cancelled, like the person wakes up, they have a cough, cold, whatever, um, would they get pushed to the back of the line or how would it be determined where they end up, where and when they get, end up getting their surgery? Yeah, I, I think this is a common uh, occurrence all the time, even before COVID-19, that people have to be well for their surgeries. And so this is an important thing. And we, you know, that's why it's, it's important when you have your surgery scheduled to make sure that you're you're staying very close to home, that you're not out mixing and mingling it, if you can help it, because we want to make sure everybody's well enough to have their surgeries as scheduled. But we do have a provincial process for this, so um, people will be fed back into the queue according to their uh, to their need, and, and people will be rescheduled, so it won't be you'll be back at the bottom of the list. It'll be rescheduled as appropriate as part of the whole system. So uh, it is incredibly important though that people are careful right now and we don't want to have any more delays so that's a, a, a really important piece to bring up and uh, people be careful before you have your scheduled surgeries make sure that uh, we have the the screening processes in place so that everybody can be confident and cared for safely next we have a question from Rob Shaw uh, Premier and Mr. Dix, I'm just hoping you could reflect on, I'm sure there are some people on that list of 30,000 canceled surgeries who are in pain and they're wondering if the decision to make the cancellations the way they were made was really worth it, given that British Columbians did step up, they flattened the curve, and we've had a record number of empty beds uh, in hospitals the last couple of months because the surge didn't emerge like the worst case scenario suggested it could. So I know you both said it was a difficult decision to cancel these surgeries, but can you address people who are wondering if it was the right call to do it in the way that you did, um, given the space that we've had uh, the last couple of months? 
Uh, it was absolutely the right call. Uh, you'll recall back in March, there was a very different discussion about COVID-19. We saw images uh, every day on television about what had gone on in Italy. We were working in the healthcare system and what this has allowed us to do in the healthcare system is respond at the acute care level at a, I think an extraordinary level of skill and care for people who are dealing with COVID-19. And so uh, it was the right decision at the time to ensure that our healthcare system was prepared, that the extraordinary anxiety that that system was facing, seeing what was happening in places such as Italy and then New York in our healthcare system, was, uh, was uh, we were able to undertake that effort with the calm that uh, Dr. Henry always uh, asked for. And so I think it was absolutely the right decision that uh, we have to continue to be prudent. And I think it's a good opportunity to remind everybody of the sacrifices that have been made, particularly by those who have, were scheduled for surgeries and have had their surgeries delayed. Those sacrifices have been profound. And why we continue to have to be 100% all in, even as circumstances change, because our ability to succeed on the surgery plan and so much else of what we're trying to do depends on people's commitment to one another, to the ones that they love and to the ones that they don't know. This has been our success as a province. It was not inevitable. It was the result of extraordinary work by public health officials, I think, in communities. I think uh, we'd all say all the people who worked on contact tracing, all the people who helped break the links of transmission, all of the people that made sacrifices in our community. Was it worth it? You bet it was. You bet it was. Uh, uh, le Premier ministre va, va ajouter quelque chose euh, juste pour dire que le, le 16 mai euh, 2020, nous avons pris la décision difficile d'annuler de nombreuses chirurgies. Nous avons également promis de ne jamais oublier les personnes affectées par cette décision. Vous êtes au centre de ce plan de renouvellement, renouvellement de la chirurgie. Nous le ferons de la manière le plus, la, le plus, la plus sûre possible. Nous ferons ce travail avec la même détermination que celle que nous avons faite en combattant COVID-19. Tous les membres de notre système de santé et tous les citoyens de notre province sont attachés à ce plan. Yeah, yeah I just, uh, going back to, to Rob's question, uh, absolutely the right thing to do, but we need to put into a context that uh, today is the day after uh, we announced our slow and focused restart plan and the first order of business is to say to those who made a significant sacrifice by uh, having their surgeries cancelled that they're at the top of the priority list for us going forward. This was a very difficult decision to make, the right decision to make, but as we made it we were mindful that these were not just numbers on spreadsheets, these were human beings, people in many cases have been waiting a long, long time and we are going to focus and, and the resolve is fairly clear from the uh, technical briefing, the commitment that we anticipate from health care providers, the resources that the Treasury will be providing so that health care, the fundamental, the fundamental principles of health care, that, that tenet of Canadian citizenship that is so important to us is the first order of business. Absolutely the right decision and this is absolutely the right response. Our next question comes from Lisa Cordasco. Thank you very much. Um, you've been very specific in saying uh, that you need 400 surgical nurses and where you will get them. But in terms of surgeons and anesthetists, how many do you need and where will you get them? Uh, we're confident to do that. I think it's fair to say that over the past decades, uh, sometimes the relationships uh, between health authorities and uh, uh, anesthetists and anesthesiologists are, have been challenging, but uh, we've, we're making progress uh, with that and we need to recruit there as well. And uh, so everybody's committed to this. We obviously need to increase our capacity in every area. One of the key areas though, and has been over the last period, is, uh, is surgical nurses. That's been a challenge over a period of time, so that's why we give focus to that today. But we're going to re require more medical office assistants, more skilled healthcare workers, uh, and, uh, and uh, obviously surgeons and uh, anesthetists. I think that uh, I think what's been sometimes a restriction in our healthcare system is that the amount of operating room time people have, not necessarily the number of surgeons. So this expansion of operating room time is going to help us as well. So it's a combination of that operating room time, of the work of the system to prepare people for surgery so that the outcomes are good. It's going to require significant investment in post-operative care. 
because that's critical to the success of any surgery. So what you're talking about is, is major investment in people to make this go forward, but it's in all of the areas, including, including of course, nursing. Next, we have a question from Cindy Harnett. Oh, thanks very much. Um, I wanted to clarify, what is the percentage of beds that will be left in COVID-designated hospitals um, in case there is a surge? Is, is there a percentage? And can you tell me what the balancing act is between the temptation to do a lot of day surgeries and hips and knee surgeries that can be done quickly um, and weighing that against complex surgeries that may include multiple days in hospital and extensive follow-up um, that would, um, you know, impose on um, COVID beds if you needed them? Well, uh, the key question is the urgency of need, and uh, you've seen that during this period. We have, we have uh, successfully completed across health authorities 17,000 surgeries, urgent surgeries and emergent or emergency surgeries in this time. And the priority there are people who required surgeries for things with, uh, with uh, lesser, uh, with uh, shorter uh, required wait periods, two, four, and six weeks. So the people who needed the care urgently got the care urgently, and 17,000 in the context of what's happened with COVID-19 is important. So what you're going to continue to see is the clinicians, is the people who are responsible for doing the surgeries, uh, setting priorities. And that means, um, uh, in part, doing surgeries that we're able to do, for example, uh, in the private clinics where we do, did a pr between 12 and 13,000 surgeries in 2018-19 and increasing that capacity and s all of that surgery is day surgery in that case because in none of those places are people able to stay overnight so those are that's all day surgery on the one hand but it's prioritizing patients one of the great successes we've had and it represented an effort by members of the legislature extraordinary effort by a skilled surgeon named Dr. Honey in Vancouver was a surgery called deep brain stimulation which takes hours and hours and hours and hours and that's been a priority as well and so we all know that a seven or eight hour surgery counts as one just as a surgery that only takes an hour but uh, we've got to balance off those things and that's our intention too there's no um, in our processes there's no gaming of the stats we need to do all kinds of surgeries day surgeries of course but also the more serious surgeries you talk about and they're already being given urgency in the system. Yeah, sure. Just to speak a little bit about some of the, the thinking that we have around what do we do if there's a resurgence and what proportion of beds would be COVID beds, et cetera. So we obviously have considered that, including um, looking at critical care. So there's some surgeries that people are more likely or will need to be in ICU afterwards. So that has an impact on our ability to provide critical care, both to people with COVID and people with other things. So we are very much looking at that balance and ensuring that in different parts of the province. Um, it may mean transporting somebody for surgery to a different area. And then as we go into the fall in particular, assuming we don't see any resurgence of COVID-19 in the summer, and that's what we'll be um, focusing on, of course, but in the fall when we start seeing influenza season again, and there's a potential for uh, what we're calling a second wave, or a resurgence of COVID-19. Then we'll be looking again. As you know, we talked about um, having 19 COVID hospitals that we had available um, and ready to go uh, through this period of time. We'll be looking more strategically come the fall because we do know more about this virus and we will be ensuring that we have our surveillance and our public health detection out there so that we can respond a little bit more nimbly and also uh, with more precision come the fall. So it may be that some hospitals will, uh, re not all 19 hospitals will need to be uh, available right away for for COVID-19 surge and we'll be able to titrate that in a better way. So those are the things, um, obviously it's very complex and those are the types of things that we're thinking through as we move forward. We have time for two more questions. The first is from Nomi Mukanda. Oh, good morning. Um, I'm just going to go through many of my questions have been asked, but I uh, wanted to know what's going to happen uh, to people from out of province who had been scheduled for specialized surgeries in BC and had them cancelled. Would they be allowed to travel here to undergo the surgery? 
Euh, premièrement, ça va dépendre des individus, je pense, euh, euh, et des circonstances, mais on va recommencer euh, nos progr notre programme de chirurgie. Mais ça, ça va dépendre premièrement euh, d'un individu. Par exemple, il y a beaucoup de monde euh, qui habitent les territoires, territoires en Colombie-Britannique, euh, au Canada, qui reçoivent leur serv service de chirurgie en Colombie-Britannique. Et pour ces gens-là, euh, on va continuer avec nos programmes, avec les limitations euh, et la nécessité de voyager. Donc, ça va être une question entre le système, euh, les médecins et, euh, et bien entendu, euh, euh, les patients. Donc, euh, ça de, va dépendre de, ce, de ces circonstances. Mais ce, on, ce, dont, on, on, ce dont on parle, c'est le, euh, le recommencement de notre pro programme de chirurgie euh, euh, élective et, et ça va inclure tout le monde euh, qui reçoit ces, ces chirurgies maintenant. Ce n'est pas en général les personnes des autres provinces, euh, c'est surtout des personnes qui habitent euh, au Yukon et euh, au territoire. And do you want to repeat that in English? Um, I think, I think. All right, our last question comes from Richard Sisman. For the Premier, uh, one of the things the education system is seeing, both K-12 and post-secondary, is going to be a huge drop-off in international students. And there are already concerns being raised that this drop-off will mean uh, teachers need to be laid off and could potentially be other changes because of the decrease in revenues. How much does this concern you for both levels of schooling? And also, um, is, are you considering, on a related note, uh, salary top-offs uh, for essential workers, as we've seen from the federal government? Uh, well, firstly, uh, with respect to the uh, top-up, uh, this is a cost-shared program. Uh, all the provinces have agreed to join with the federal government. Minister James uh, is working uh, with the federal government to uh, put in place the plan for British Columbia. Many of the workers, uh, frontline workers uh, in residential care, for example, where some of the focus of the federal government has been, uh, are already well above what the threshold number would be. So British Columbia will be developing a plan in concert with the federal government that meets the needs of a broader uh, group of employees. But uh, we're grateful to have the federal resources and we're going to be doing our part to address uh, the need in that area. Uh, when it comes to international students, this is uh, at the, at the uh, post-secondary level as we see uh, people retooling for the new economy, what the world will be like for them going forward, we need to ensure that we have a maximum number of spaces in our post-secondary institutions, whether it be uh, for uh, skills training, whether it be for uh, training to become care aides, to uh, go into uh, some other medical field or any number of other areas. So we're fairly confident that our post-secondary sector uh, has the capacity to, to take in uh, those new students who, uh, because of other work that we've done on adult basic education, for example, and English language learning, will be able to uh, meet the needs of the community right here in British Columbia. Uh, we also understand the value of uh, foreign students, uh, international students coming to our post-secondary institutions. So we'll be working with the university presidents on how, how we uh, deploy uh, spaces for that uh, cohort. Uh, when it comes to uh, the K-12 system, uh, every district has a different approach to international students. And uh, we'll, M Minister Fleming and I will have more to say about the K-12 system uh, in the weeks ahead as we look to the wrap-up of this year and prepare uh, for the beginning of the 2021 uh, school year. And international students may well have a key role to play in that, and that will be determined uh, district by district. Uh, but I certainly we're not contemplating layoffs, quite the contrary. Education is the key uh, to success for individuals and for communities. It's the great equalizer in our society. We have been committed from the beginning to expand access to education for all British Columbians, and, and we'll continue to do that. That's all the time we have today. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you.